Welcome to Millennium Bible Institute's introductory course on rightly dividing the word. Now, let me ask you a question right off the bat, and that's the, has the Bible ever seemed to contradict itself to you? Do you ever read something in one place, and then at another time you're reading somewhere else, and you think, boy, that, that doesn't sound like what I read. You go back, you try to find that other place, and maybe you do, maybe you don't. Or if that hasn't happened to you, how about this? How about you've turned on the TV one day, and you heard a guy preaching, and he's giving you verses, and he's making these points, and then you hear another guy, and he's making the very opposite point, and he's using verses. Both guys' verses make perfect sense with what they're saying. And then, you know what that does? That kind of drives you crazy, and you begin to scratch your head and say, you know what, nobody can know for sure. And if you give up on that, well, that's a shame. Because God did not give you His Word to confuse you, but rather to educate you. Well, what I would like to do is explain to you what's going on when you see those kinds of things. Or, or to explain to you, you know, people often outside of Christianity look at the different denominations and they say, they all claim to believe the Bible, but this group says this and this and this is what you practice. And this group says, no, this and this and this. And then another group disagrees with both of those. They may have a few things in common, but they even, like, they all may think baptism, but this one dips and this one sprinkles and that one wash rags. And it's all different. Nobody knows exactly what's going on. Well, I understand that that's a little bit confusing and and, and you may be wondering, I, I, or may be thinking, I'll never get this book figured out. And whoever I sit under is just going to be their opinion. Well, listen, God is not unaware of what these verses read. And when I said to you that this was an introductory study on rightly dividing the Word, that is the key to understanding your Bible. Now, that's, I almost hesitate to say that because that sounds a little hokey. Everybody has the key to whatever it is. But believe me, you will never properly handle the Word of God until you learn to do what it commands you to do in 2 Timothy 2.15. So what is rightly dividing the Word? Where do I get that expression? Let's take a look at it in the Scripture. We'll go to the PowerPoint here and take a look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Now, in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is writing one of his pastoral epistles to Timothy, who is a pastor. And he's talking to him about how to conduct the affairs of the local assembly. And the very important thing that Timothy is supposed to instill in everyone is the proper handling of God's Word and the proper study of God's Word through the right division rightly dividing the word of truth. And when you see that phrase, you know from the terminology that there are divisions placed in the Bible. Now, if that's throwing you for a loop a little bit, when you get through watching this, you should go over and watch the introductory uh, study that we did on the timeline. We're actually going to discuss over there the two major programs and where the, the, the books of the Bible actually align themselves so that you can get a handle on which books go where. Now, I'm not going to be doing that work in this study. We did that over there. In this study, though, what I would like to do is show you some examples of the failure of Bible study if it is not according to rightly dividing the Word. Because I guarantee you, if you don't rightly divide the Word, you're going to come up against one contradiction after another. It'll yield nothing but confusion for you. So let's take a look at the first one, and let me just list them on the, on the board here. The first we're going to look at is keeping the law. There are those that maintain that you have to keep the law to be saved. Other people say, no, you don't keep the law to be saved, but you have to keep the law to stay saved. And then there are those who say, no, you don't keep the law to be saved, don't keep the law to stay saved, but you have to keep the law to, 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 to be in right fellowship with God. And then those that say, no, you don't need to keep the law to be in any of those. Well, so which of those are true? And, and, and are those really manifested in the Bible? Well, let me show you. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23 and take a look with me here in verse 1. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, 
that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now, isn't that pretty remarkable that he says, all that they say to you, do that. Now, when he makes that statement, he's ta talking about a command to obey the law. But now, that's over in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, you know, or you should, is under God's program with Israel. But now, let's go to the dispensation of grace. Now we're going to go to Romans chapter 6 and take a look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. So see, there is no commandment here when you get to Romans chapter 6. This is to the body of Christ, not to Israel. Now, I'm going to abbreviate these things after this, but I just want to have that up there so that you'll get it. Let me just say that Paul says plainly that you're not under grace. There's a great truth hidden here, by the way, when he says, sin will not have dominion over you for or because you're not under the law. Grace has a power to do something the law never had the power to do. And that's important. And, and, and that's why not, keep, not obeying the law is exactly what God wants you to do in the dispensation of grace because He's trying to produce functional life in you that could never be produced by the law. That's another subject. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to look at some things. Look at 1 Timothy 1.7. Now, before we read it, let me, just, let me just show you that Paul is talking about here in Romans, you're in the dispensation of grace. So I'm just going to put this up here. You're in the dispensation of grace. But back here uh, in the Gospels, just like you are in the Old Testament, you're in a dispensation of the law. Paul knows that in his time there are people coming along and they are teaching the law for all manner of things, some to be saved, some to stay saved, some to be right with God. Here's what Paul says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, this is what they were doing, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. I left out the verse in which he actually attacks their knowledge on the thing. He, he makes a very unkind remark, and I'm not trying to be PC about it, but we are going to get to that verse sooner or later. But the thing is, these are people that wanted to be teachers of the law. Paul said these folks, they don't understand what they're talking about. Because in the dispensation of grace... We are not under the law. Paul says that their teaching is vain jangling. That's not a compliment. Now, Moses never told the people they were not under the law. Moses said, you're under it. The prophets said, you're under it. And Jesus never told the people that they weren't under it. Because in the program with Israel under the law, in that program with Israel, they definitely were. But when God interrupted that program and started this dispensation of grace, God did away with the law, which is that middle wall of partition, and broke it down, and now uh, deals with us in a totally different way. Here's the next thing. Let's just kind of move along here. The next one is dietary restrictions. Let's just do it like that. There are people that are going to say, oh, you have to watch what you eat. Preachers. Well, you know, you can't eat pork. Well, you know, if, if, that's not, if that's what God wanted, I'd do whatever He wanted me to do. That's not the issue. It's not that I love ham and bacon so much, I just can't stay away from it. There are plenty of things I like better, as a matter of fact. But there is a, there is a doctrine for somebody in the Bible in which they are told to stay away from certain things. Look with me here in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel. See, that should ring a bell with you. The children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the... I know out in West Texas they say cud, and some people say cud, and I don't really care... But anyway, they chew it. And, or of them that divide the hoof as the camel, because he cheweth the cud and divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud but divideth not the hoof, 
he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. He gives this whole thing to them over and over again about some animals are okay for you to eat and some are not okay to eat. And what people do is they go back to Leviticus, Leviticus 11. I mean, that's the Mosaic law. I mean, Paul just got through telling you, you're not under the law, but under grace. So what are the first thing they do? They go back to the law and pull the dietary restrictions in. Hey, did you not read sixth grade English in Romans 6? That's really what I'm wondering. But just to be kind about it for a little longer, let's take a look at what our apostle says over here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, which again is to the body of Christ. And here's what he says starting in verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, if you, for whatever reason, cannot in good conscience thankfully receive that thing, then you know what? Don't eat it. But he says, but for those that understand and know the truth, there is nothing to be refused. Can we have a ham sandwich? You bet you can. Well, I'm a, but I'm a Messianic Jew. Well, <laughs> guess what? If you're in the dispensation of grace, God doesn't see that because he says specifically, there is no Jew or Gentile. No bond or free. No ma- In the body of Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. And you know what that means? There is no national heritage attached to you. In this dispensation, you can eat whatever you want. It doesn't matter what nation you were born in. That program of Israel was suspended in Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen, and you are in a dispensation of grace. You will not practice the law, and you will not practice dietary restrictions to do anything with God except demonstrate your ignorance. You should go on and learn some other things about this. Paul says about, this, uh, about this, this dietary restriction that we can just eat whatever we want. Now, I know that sounds a little bit rough, but here's the thing. For a long time, we have in, embraced this, I don't know, namby-pamby type of Christianity that just kind of floats along, and it's sugary, and it, it never, you know, and, and we almost apologize for standing for the truth. I tell you what we're really trying to do. We're trying to engage people who are serious about Bible study here. If you're not serious, you're not going to stick with us anyway. I already know. I'm not going to fool you with an introductory study, and then when you get into the other stuff, you won't realize what's going on. You will. The corner will turn at some point. So let's turn it now. You will either believe what the Bible says in the portion that is written to you and about you. You know, I didn't do that in that thing on the timeline, even though it's up on the board. There are, there are areas there in Israel's program which are for us to know, but that area in the dispensation of grace is specifically to you and about you. Conduct yourself accordingly if you're going to act like a believer who understands the age in which he's living. Now, if you don't, you know what? It is a free country, and as a son... You can walk away from all of that and do whatever you want. But God doesn't say just because you're a son, you're a necessarily good one or smart one. You're still a son. He'll, but you know what? I'm just trying to say, if you're serious about it, then you need to understand what the Bible says. All right, let's look at the next one. The next one is observances. When you talk about observances... You're talking about the things that we practice. Uh, Some folks say, (laughs) I know there's a particular denomination that says if you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. So they, of course, go on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. The seventh day is Saturday. And, of course, you would actually count that from 6 o'clock the previous day to 6 o'clock in the evening that day, and that would be your Sabbath. And if you don't worship on the Sabbath, then there's something wrong with you. Well, the Apostle Paul says something about that. And, of course, even the Old Testament says something about that. So let's take a look again in the book of Exodus. So we'll just put Exodus up here. And let's take a look here on the PowerPoint starting chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. 
thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, thy cattle, thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God gave the Sabbath day to Israel for a very specific reason, and that was in Exodus chapter 20. And that reason has something to do with the creation, with that, that Sabbath that followed creation. There was something happening back there in the Garden of Eden, and He wanted that to ever be before them. It had to do with the very reason that He created the heavens and the earth. And isn't, and isn't it a coincidence? I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, that in the very passage about the Sabbath, he reminds them, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Why would he reference back to that? Oh, just kind of an aside, it popped into his head. No, that's exactly what the observance was about. Now, when we get over to the dispensation of grace, we're going to go to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, and we'll take a look. Let no man therefore judge you in meat... Uh, ham sandwiches, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days. Uh, Paul lists all of those things. So when you get over to doctrine that is written specifically to us and about us in the dispensation of grace, here's what we find. We're not under the law, but under grace. We can eat whatever we want. If you think, you know, no, look, there's some things I don't want to eat. Uh, the, Alaska, uh, the, 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 the Eskimos eat muktuk. I wouldn't step on muktuk, let alone put it in my mouth. You ever seen that? We had a missionary up there one time. I, I mean, there's no way. So for me, <laughs> hey, even though God says, hey, if you like it, you can eat it. <laughs> Fortunately, as a son, I get to choose what I'll eat. But it's not a law observance. It just has to do with stuff that's so gross, I can't hardly stand to look at it observances now that's something again god says okay you guys under the israel program you're going to have these observances but in the dispensation of grace you don't do those things do you know why because observances let me just give you something very important here these are part of a religion the only religion that god ever established in the history of the world was judaism it was a religion you know what that means there were things that you did to practice it you, you worshiped on a Sabbath, on a, de, a certain day. You brought a, a, a male lamb of the first year that was without blemish to a certain place and a certain thing was done with it. On another day, you observed a feast day. and another, uh, you observed holy days. You observed things that you could, all, I can't eat this. I have to wash before I do that. There's a, there's a ceremony for this. And there's a, that's the practice of religion. And God gave that to the Jewish people because they rejected the edification He gave them between Egypt and Sinai and signed on to the law contract. And God from that day forward dealt with them as children, not as adult sons. They will get that adoption. Paul says the adoption pertaineth unto Israel, but they're not going to get it till they get out there and get the new covenant and go into the kingdom. Until that time... They're under the tutors and governors of the law. They practice a religion. You, however, don't have a religion to practice. You have a relationship to engage in, a father-son relationship. That's why it's called your sonship edification. Hey, you're, you, you, you can take away everything I own. You didn't take away anything from me as far as what I have with God because what I have with God is not in, in books or beads or anything else. I don't practice a religion. I am actively engaged in a relationship with my heavenly Father. And that thing began the day I received Jesus Christ as my all-sufficient Savior. We don't have... So the things that go along with the practice of a religion puts you out of sonship and back as a child who has to be led about like a horse with a bit and bridle. You're not making sonship decisions. A child has limited decision making. As sons, we're given liberty. Oh, there's a whole doctrine here. Now, I'm just trying to say to you that this is not about what we like or what we prefer or what we think is the neatest. This is about living in a program that God has established. And it's His program, by the way. He has to run it the way He wants to. Now, you can, as a son, you can walk away from that. And you can walk back over here all you want to. Just understand that at the judgment seat of Christ, you are going to face that. 
No, you're not going to lose your salvation. No, you're not going to be kicked out of the heavenly places into purgatory. But you will have a consequence, a very real consequence to those actions that you will regret for all eternity. Well, God said He's going to wipe away all tears. <laughs> oh, there's another thing about rightly dividing the Word, isn't it? Let's run to the book of Revelation and immediately throw that on a people that aren't even present when Revelation's taken place. Wonderful. But exactly what we're doing here is we are rightly dividing the word of truth. We're observing a division in the scripture here. Let's look at the next one. Daily provision. <laughs> this one used to give me fits. I never could figure out how to do this. I tried to do this as a Christian. And, you know, I heard a guy came into our church one time and he said, you guys aren't living by faith. You're not living by faith. You don't pray, give us this day our daily bread. You got food in the cabinet. You don't need to trust God for nothing. You're not living by faith. And I used to wonder about that. And I thought, you know, I want to please God. I want to live by faith. So what am I supposed to do? Get, get rid of all the food in my cabinet and every day trust God to bring it in. Well, I didn't know anybody <laughs> observing that. And I, but really, that was a conundrum to me because here's the, here's the scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now that's what he says there. And of course, we're over there in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, which if you observe rightly dividing the word, you understand that in Matthew, you're still in the program with Israel because Israel's Messiah has shown up. He came to His own, remember? And His own received Him not. This is still the program with Israel. And you know what he's doing? He is calling out those who are going to go preach the gospel of the kingdom. And you know what the command was to do? Get rid of everything. Sell what you have. Give the money to the poor. Come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, everybody that preaches out of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 over there, they strangely omit that doctrine to the congregations they preach it to. But what they do want to talk about is, you don't have to worry, you seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So you're telling me that no honest Christian has ever gone hungry. The Apostle Paul would disagree with you because he gives testimony to the very opposite. That is for the Israel program, under the law. So what does Paul say to us? What, what, what is it that, that we are supposed to do? Actually, I think I have another one. I think I have another one before I read you that. Matthew 10, 7. Let's look at that. Yeah. And as you go, preach saying, this is where he sends them out. The, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Provide neither gold or silver or brass in your purses, nor script in your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Do you know what he said? Don't carry anything with you. Can you imagine, we're gonna, I'm going to send you out two by two. You're going to go out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. By the way, empty your wallets. Don't take any extra clothes. Now get out there and do it. And guess what? Take no thought because if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. You won't go hungry. You won't get cold. You won't lack for a place to stay. You, all this will be provided for you. But when you get into the dispensation of grace, take a look with me here in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, and that you study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we have commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Now, Paul says you're not going to get... You're not going to get what you need because you're going to sit back in the dispensation of grace and go, as 1 Thessalonians says... He says, you're not going to sit back in this dispensation and go, okay, God, I love you, so pour it on me. <laughs> Look, you know, I got to tell you, somebody's working. So he says, if you want to work with your own hands, you can have lack of nothing, but you'll have to, you'll have to work. And you say, well, that doesn't seem as spiritual to me. Actually, this is the more spiritual of the two programs. I'm not trying to be ugly. I know I've been hard in this one. If you've seen the other introductory studies, they've been much nicer. But look, I have to be honest with you. It is our 
immense, I'm saying this not to be offensive, this is the accurate word, our immense ignorance of the program that is at work today that causes us to look at this and say, well, that doesn't seem as spiritual as the other. The other was a very physical, material program. This is the spiritual program. Now, I'm, I'm saying it. Let me just give you another verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Do you not see a contradiction in what's going on here? Get rid of all your stuff and don't worry about it. God will give it to you. And over here is, if you don't work, don't expect to eat. Those are not the same thing. No one in their right mind would look at the things that we've detailed here and say, oh yeah, they're all saying the same thing. They are not. So the thing I need to say to you is, when you rightly divide the word, you are observing some very obvious divisions that are in the word. One more. Let's do this one very quickly. We're kind of running out of time here. And this one is on baptism. When you talk about baptism, you run into Matthew chapter 3 down there and John the Baptist at the river Jordan preaching repentance to Israel. Let's read it starting in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. I'm just going to write it on the board here and we'll come back to it in just a second. Matthew chapter 3. All right, now stay with the PowerPoint. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you, here's another with, with the Holy Ghost and with fire there's three baptisms in this verse alone now when you come now that's over in israel's program you have a a number of baptisms but when you get into the dispensation of grace take a look at what paul says in ephesians 4 there is one body and one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one baptism over here I can find seven. Some folks think there are 12 baptisms back here. But when you get into the dispensation of grace, there's one. Now, that verse alone runs contrary to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I'm just trying to show you that these are the things. And and by the way, that word baptism, that's a word that we always equate with water. That's what's commonly thought about it. If it says the word baptism, it must mean water. But look, this one's with water, this one's with the Holy Ghost, and this one's with fire. So don't always define a term the same way. You understand that those baptisms are really different. And if Paul says that that one baptism, by the way, is not about this baptism, that's what Paul, a lot of folks you say, well, yeah, that one baptism, when you get baptized in the baptistry, then you become part of the body. That's not what that one baptism is in the dispensation of grace. John's baptism is a baptism of water. Look in John 1.32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. See what he says, he that sent me to baptize with water. Now, Now, John, he did do that. But what did Paul say over in 1 Corinthians about that baptism in water? Here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. John was baptizing everybody that believed his message. Paul said, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach preach the gospel. Uh, And and that's exactly what he does. These are just some of the issues that I wanted us to look at here. You know, our time has kind of winded down on us here. But if you don't understand that there are divisions that are placed in the Word of God and that there are scriptures that are to a group that is under the law and there are scriptures that are to a group that is not under the law and that God has dealt with those groups differently and has given them different marching orders and different instructions, then what you're going to do is you're going to wind up in the cycle of never-ending debate where they pull out a scripture that says, well, you're supposed to keep the law. And then someone else pulls out a scripture that says, no, you're not. And they pull out a scripture that says, you can't eat pork. And they pull out a scripture that says, you can eat anything. And then they pull out a scripture that says, you better observe the Sabbath. 
Sabbath. And then they pull out a scripture that says, you don't observe the Sabbath. And then they pull out a scripture that says, you just trust God for what you're going to get. Don't worry about working. And then you pull out a scripture over here that says, you better work or you won't eat. And then they pull out a scripture that says, you better get baptized in water. And yet you got a scripture over here that says, it's not all those baptisms, just one. It's one performed by the Spirit. Then it, and it doesn't matter. It's like people are crazy. You, you got a guy quoting this one, and then a guy just quotes a different verse, and then he just quotes his next verse, and then this guy quotes. Look, stop that. If you're going to really understand the Bible, you need to understand how to rightly divide the Word. This is just an introductory study to say to you, this, these are nothing more than examples of how important this issue is. What you have to do is go into the study that we have in the Institute, in which we've got about eight hours over there, to show you the details of rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, th this is important. These are things that apply to you in this day. Now, I'm actually looking at the things that I've le left here to cover, and, you know, I don't think I'm going to get to all of this, so let me just kind of uh, uh, synopsis this thing and show you. On the timeline of events, we're going to make three real basic divisions here. Paul is writing right here. Paul is writing in Ephesians chapter 2. And he, from this point, talks about things that were going on in, and this is the way he calls it, in time past. And when he says, in time past, here's the situation we Gentiles were in. We were strangers from the uh, commonwealth of Israel and from the covenants of promise. We were without God and without hope in the world and without Christ and all that bit. He said, we were totally undone back here. We were far off. He says, but now, and he's talking about the great dispensational change that took place when God interrupted the program with Israel, saved Saul of Tarsus, and commissioned him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, ushering in a dispensation of grace, not law, and offering that grace in a message that was different from the twelve that walked with Jesus. Theirs was the gospel of the kingdom. This one is the gospel of the grace of God. And as he does, he says, but now, it, you, it was like that back then, but now it's like this. When this age is over, he says, about those things that will be happening in the ages to come. And that's the things that are out on the other side of this program. Think of these programs as a sandwich. Here's the bread, and here's the meat, and here's the bread. And both of these, this is an Israel program, and this is an Israel program. This is the completion of the Israel program because it got interrupted here. And this is the program with the church, the body of Christ. And the doctrines that apply specifically to us now, in the but now period, are the books of Romans to Philemon. Now, this, this is the essence of rightly dividing the word. I want you to see that. I encourage you to go over, get that bigger study, look at the details of it, and make your own decision about that. You are going to have to make your own decision. You can't make it at the judgment seat by going, well, that guy, you know, at Millennium Bible Institute, he said it, so I, you know, like God, I'm banking on that. That won't do it either. This is something that's going to have to be yours, and you're going to have to own it. So I am pleading with you to examine these issues. They are the difference between functional life and functional death. And, and, and that is all the difference in the world. Uh, and if we had time to talk about it, I would. And there are those kinds of things that are going to be on our website anyway, and you can look at them over there. And I really hope that you will. So from here, go over and check out those other introductory studies. Take a look at the timeline. If you're unfamiliar, take a look at the King James issue. And if you're not familiar with the mystery and, and, and the dispensation of grace, go take a look at that introduction to the mystery so that these things can all come together to give you an understanding of what God has prepared for you in a very unique and special and distinct dispensation that he ushered in with the Apostle Paul and will end at the rapture of the church. God bless you as you study the word.